Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Puppet Masters and Castle Freaks, the internet's leading all things Charles Band podcast. I am one of your hosts, Jared Hornbeck, and today we are bringing you a very special episode. We're breaking format a little bit. We're not here to talk about one movie. We're here to talk about a lot of movies. Uh, all of the movies so far that we've covered, and when I say we, I'm talking about myself, but who else am I talking about? Well, hi, it's Steve Gunley coming here from Austin, Texas. Uh, yes, we recently commemorated the 50th movie that we've watched on our show. You know, we've doubled up on a couple of episodes, so I don't think we've quite hit 50 episodes yet, but we have hit soon the 50 movie mark. Uh, and we felt like the rankings on our show have kind of come and go. We're aware of it. We have been maintaining our lists on our own, but as the list gets longer, it becomes more and more of a chore to like fit it into an episode when we have a guest and like we don't want to uh, mm. be holding them there because you know we're we're uh, spreadsheet nerds, you know. So we have to. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to dedicate a little bit of time here to catch up on our lists uh, to figure out where our rankings are and see kind of where we stand as we hit this fifty movie milestone. Um, so for me, I, I I figured we could just kind of go back and forth right we start from the bottom of our list and work our way up well that sounds great steve and to the absolute surprise of no one who listened well actually no you know what i'm hmm. gonna I'm, I'm gonna refrain from saying what i was just gonna say okay. because i do feel like people might have expected something and i think at least one of us hmm. maybe both of us might be flipping the script on him here uh, at the very bottom for me at number 50, Beach Babes 2, Cave Girl Island. Finally, Usurping Evil Bong, which I think was uh, holding strong at the very, very bottom of our list for a long time. But I am right there with you. Uh, my new bottom movie, Beach Babes 2, Cave Girl Island. Truly an unpleasant uh, experience to kind of sit through. Really tacky and uh, poorly shot and annoying and just kind of gross. Uh, not a fun movie. No, and, uh, you know, the movie has a purpose. Its purpose is not to be discussed on a podcast. Yeah, yeah, but I would argue it fails at its other purpose, you know? Like, it, there's nothing sadder than, like, a, a, an erotic slash titillating movie that is neither erotic nor titillates. Um, it, it's just kind of an inert lump. So, bad movie, bottom of the list. And I think, of no surprise, we uh, it's just narrowly edging out. We kind of already mentioned it. Just above that is Evil Bong for both of us. Yes. Evil Bong is slotting in at number 49 for both of us. Uh, again, to the surprise of no one who listens to it. Now, I just want to borrow a phrase from the We Hate Movies podcast. It's okay to like a movie. Yeah. If you are an Evil Bong fan, I'm glad that you found something in this particular movie and franchise to relate to or something to gravitate toward. Now, admittedly, both Steve and myself are unfamiliar with the sequels. Yeah. So for all we yeah, know, we haven't gotten there yet. they could go in a completely different direction that we really enjoy. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm uh, not discounting that, you know, Ginger right. Dead Dan Man 2 was an improvement over the first one. Like I'm not, I'm not going to discount that possibility. Uh, where do you come in after that? Number 47. So or here is where I, me, number 48, number 48. Here's where I feel like we're going to start to deviate a little bit mm -hmm. in our list. So, I have at number 48, third to last, only really because of, I don't, I can't imagine a situation where I'm going to rewatch this movie. There might be technically worse ones in terms of like how they're made yeah. than, than, the, than this one, but I know I'm never going to revisit this movie. It's Test Tube Teens from the year 2000. Yeah. For Moonlight, me, I've got that uh, at number 48. Moonlight has not had the strongest showing, uh, you know, and I think that that trend might continue a little bit. But like I said, do you, this mean, is where... do you mean Torchlight? Oh, excuse me. Torchlight. Yeah. Torchlight. Moonbeam is a different thing. But yeah, Torchlight. Um, yeah. This is where we deviate a little bit because my number 48 is going to be Witch House, David Dakota's movie uh, that I found just one of the hardest like 80 minute movies to sit through of any of the ones we've covered. Just a really kind of indifferent uh dull thriller yeah so that was number 48 for you Steve. yeah mm -hmm. we're we're pretty closely linked here because that was number 47 for me yeah number 47 was witch house just narrowly beating out test tube teens from the year 2000 like 
it was a photo finish for for third to last, and I went with test tube teens. Uh, I don't know that I necessarily envision a scenario where I rewatch Witch House, the first Witch House again, either. No, um, you know, Ricky will, will get you be... back on a better episode. Oh, poor Ricky, Ricky again. We're sorry, we're sorry that we brought you on for that one. Um, I I am un- under the impression that the sequels are better, and yeah. we will be covering the sequels sooner than later. And so I am looking forward to continuing the series more so than I'm looking forward to continuing the evil bong series. But, um, I will say that the first witch house, pretty bland, pretty boring, Mm -hmm. pretty forgettable. And I'm sad about the, my next one. But before I do that, tell me your number 47, my number 47, again, we're starting, we're, we're deviating a little bit more. My number 47 is demonic toys too. Uh, another movie that I just found very dull, uh, very hard to look at. I think it's a poorly shot movie. And even the presence of Leslie Jordan uh, was not enough to elevate the movie for me. So, yeah, Demonic Toys 2, I think I came down a little harder on that one than you did. But not by much. No, but the reason I mentioned that I'm sad is because I had such a nostalgic connection at an impressionable time to my number 46 movie, Beach Babes from Beyond, Mm -hmm. uh, that to to, to put it so low on the list and to be like, oh, there's not a lot of redeeming qualities here, but despite all of the celebrity siblings and despite Linnea Quigley being in it and despite it being just the hallmark of the USA Up All Night, Skinamax type movie that I look back on so fondly, there's not a whole lot there. So number 46 for me is Beach Babes from Beyond. I'm in a similar vein with my number 46. It's uh, Test Tube Teens from the year 2000. We've covered that already a little bit. Um, so I will lob it back to you for your number 45. Uh, so we've been we've strayed, but not as far as I would have anticipated to this point because my number 45 is Demonic Toys 2. Yep. And I feel like you said what, you, what needed to be said about that movie. I don't know <laughs> that I can add anything on to it. I know... We just recently did a guest spot on uh, Movie Dumpster, Mm -hmm. and they even brought up in passing about how they came on our show to watch that movie and how it stuck with them. I was going to say for better or worse, but really just for worse. Yeah, pretty much for worse. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will uh, go with my number 45, Beach Babes from Beyond, Yeah, which you've already spoken about. I think the the slight saving grace for that movie is that it has a little bit more of a uh, positive vibe to it like it doesn't feel sure. quite as creepy and it's it's got kind of like a, a beach blanket bingo sort of enthusiasm to it but it's still uh, pretty boring overall yeah i would agree with you and so those ones uh, demonic toys 2 beach babes witch house test tube evil bong uh, beach babes 2 those are my those are my bottom six of my mm-hmm. list here, bringing me up to number 44. Now, I struggled a little bit with where to put this one, but I had to really think about rewatchability. Mm-hmm. What what are they, what's really getting put up on screen? And I had to ignore the fact, like, is it a well-known franchise? Ginger Dead Man. The yeah. first Ginger Dead Man. I'm popping it down there at uh, number 44. Yeah. 44, okay. yeah. And we'll have more to say on that uh, shortly, I believe. But uh, number 44 for me may be a bit of a surprise for some people because this is a uh, – I think this is a movie with more of a fan base and more better, a little better regard than any of the other films we've talked about. But Sorority Babes and the Slimeball Bolorama Too did low. not really move the needle for me. Too um, low. Yeah, yeah, I know. See, I know. I'm gonna I, echo I our fan base. Little... You don't. You can put your phones down. You don't have to angrily uh, tweet or DM Steve. I'm telling him also, it's too low on your list. You know, I, it still feels right to me. I, I, I think it's just kind of a boring movie, uh, and it, it feels pretty different. It does. It's not even like quite campy enough to be fun. But that's all. I me. Am, that's me. I am going to disagree with you. I'm not saying that it's you know in my top. 10 or 20 even, Mm. but I I do have it higher up on the list. So my number 43 is one, I'm going to say the name of the movie and listeners might be like, I don't remember you covering that movie because we covered it on another show. And we have a little rule on our show where if we 
talk about a movie on a different podcast. We're not going to double dip because we bring a lot of our historical context and research with us onto that show and it would just be a lot of repetition. So my number 43 is Creepazoids from yeah. 1987, another uh, Linnea Quigley, David Dakota joint. Uh, we covered this movie on Neon Brainiacs. So mm -hmm. jump on to uh, Neon Brainiacs uh, main feed for their podcast and scroll back a couple of months and you will find our episode. Uh, I kind of feel like what you said about sorority babes for this one. I think there are some memorable images. I think it's got a cool cover art. It's a title that gets thrown around a lot. But I think when push comes to shove, it's kind of a boring movie. And it's just one of those ultra cheap one set wonders that doesn't really yeah. transcend, in my opinion. And, you know, so we've had our first real deviation here. What are what did you slot in for number 43? Number 43 for me is Killjoy. Um, mm. Not to be a Killjoy, but I found this movie to be like there, there are things I liked about it. Uh, there's kind of a, a vibe about it that I enjoy and a couple of good performances, but it's a movie that kind of needs to settle down and simplify a little bit. They've just got kind of too much shit going on and it makes it sure. hard to engage with it in any way. Yeah. I'm not entirely disagreeing with that. It's not this far down on my list, but it's again, it's towards the, the bottom half of the movies for sure. And I apologize in advance to everyone's childhood mm -hmm. because from my number 42 pre hysteria, yeah. Moonbeam's uh, inaugural movie, Prehysteria. Not because it's bad. And I think I feel like I need to get that out in the open. It's not that I think Prehysteria is a bad movie. I think it's perfectly acceptable children's entertainment. But when I was making the list, I thought about, like, what is the rewatchability factor for a movie like this for me? And I don't have that nostalgia tied to this. Yeah. So this movie didn't have a soft spot for me. Had I seen it, had I been a couple years younger and discovered it at age eight, age nine, sometime around then, I think I would have a real fondness for it. Uh, yeah. Like a lot of our listeners probably do. So it's not because I think it's a bad movie. It's just I can't imagine a scenario where I'm going to revisit it. And it just kind of fell kind of flat for me as an obvious, like, we know Jurassic Park is in the works and it's coming. Let's churn out a dinosaur movie. Yeah. And it did well. I mean, it did, it did well. really it was a, well. It's their, still their biggest hit. It's still the biggest hit that uh, Charles Bannon's ever been yeah. attached not, to. Not the biggest hit with me, though. That yeah. was uh, number 42 on my list. What about you, Steve? My number 42, a lot of what you said uh, about prehysteria could apply to my number 42, which was Albert Pune's Arcade. Uh, a real bummer. Uh, of a, I was looking forward to this one as a video game nerd, as somebody who like really was looking for that early 90s arcade mm -hmm. feel to be captured. I feel like this movie just didn't capture any of it. And it's troubled production means it's just sort of a nothing movie. You know, we're waiting for... You know, it, it's just all waiting to get to the fireworks factory. And then when you get there, it's pretty shitty looking and boring. So that was Arcade. We had fun talking to Jordan Morris on that one, though. So I did enjoy that. Uh, yeah, what's your number 41? It was a lot of fun to record. So my number 41 is is one that I, I can't say I disliked per se, um, but I do think the sort of disjointed nature of it and the, the, the shitty way in which a lot of the CGI and it looks really lowered it for me. It's Piranha Women. Yeah. And so Piranha Women, you know, it, that comes in at number 41 for me. So really kind of rounding out the bottom 10. Yeah. Uh, and it, I, I feel like that's an appropriate place for it. I mean, this is like a 60 minute movie. Yeah. That was broken into episodes and presented that way. It's scattershot. It's all over the place. I don't, you know, but I do think it's got a couple of endearing moments and some memorable visuals. But for the most yeah. part, it's just that early to mid 2000s, just gross looking CGI. And it's just, I can't really imagine going back and revisiting it for any other reason other than uh, doing a ranking of these movies. So it's sitting there yeah. at number 41. What about you? My number 41 might piss a couple of people off, and I know oh, uh, apologies in advance to Ooh, Doug McCambridge, boy. but it's Ghoulies. It's the first Ghoulies wow. is my number 41, a movie that 
just does not connect with me. And you might think that's crazy that I host this podcast and uh, Ghoulies is ranking so low for me because that's such a signature unqualified. film for so many fans. Sir, you are uh, unqualified to host this show. I think I that... Made that- You've, we've we've said this many times, yeah, yeah. We've 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 talked about replacing me with Christopher Plummer a few times now. Um, yeah, just just CGIing him in at the last minute. Yeah, no, yeah, Ghoulies is just not a movie that works for me. I'm sorry, everybody. I I, I wish no ill on anybody who uh, connects with that movie, but it just doesn't work for me. Similarly to Steve, um, my number forty didn't really work for me either, and it's arcade. Yep. Albert Pune's arcade. So really like only uh, mine came in only about two spaces higher than Steve's. So I was not outraged by his choice. And again, Jordan Morris, a uh, super fun guest on that movie. And the thing about Ghoulies, we had an amazing time recording that episode. Kevin Lane was an yeah. amazing guest. Ghoulies yeah, 1 and yeah. 2. Uh, I think we'll find Ghoulies 2, uh, you know, slightly different positions on our list. But yeah. Uh, you know, fun to talk about, but the point of the rankings here isn't which episode do we have the most fun recording or yeah, you know, which ones do we think are going to get the most downloads. It's sort of like as these are just 50 movies, irrespective of one in one another. Yeah. Where do where do they rank? And so to me, uh, yeah, I think you, I think you can you can definitely say that the first Ghoulies movie, it's really uh, I I feel like it's lower tier. I mean, it's scattershot. Doug Doug is angry. Doug's angry. Yeah, we apologize, Doug. Doug. Uh, I'm going to go with my number 40, which is uh, Ginger Dead Man, which you already kind of covered. A fascinating Mm -hmm. story behind that movie. It sounds like Gary Busey is really memorably insane, but he does not bring much of that energy to the movie, which I think really needed a little extra boost, which I think we both agree it did find to a certain degree later. Uh, how about your uh, 39? So my 39 is Killjoy. Again, yeah. a movie we talked in that episode. Stevie Webb was the ghost, uh, the guest on, not the ghost. He's alive he, and well. He, he's he fine. was the guest on that episode. And uh, again, such a fun episode to to record. A, m- more fun was had talking about that movie than watching it. Yeah. I think uh, Angel Vargas portrayed um killjoy in an interesting way i thought they framed some shots and revealed the character in ways that were kind of fun but there's just stuff that just prevents it from me from being totally successful i mean it has the cgi bullet spray one of the worst effects i've ever seen in my (laughs) life and compared to another i'm doing air quotes here urban horror movie that will that is higher up on our list for sure i can say that without even looking at it yeah Uh, it just kind of falls flat in terms of performances and stuff but you know made made by people of color for people of color uh, i think it's admirable in that way it's just less successful than some of the other alchemy stuff that will we'll get to a little bit further along on our list but that's my uh, that's my number 39 killjoy steve what about you Mine is Piranha Women, which you okay, talked so about a little bit. still some overlap. Uh, yeah, a little bit of overlap. Uh, you know, if, if a movie with uh, uh, teeth titties is not enough to move the needle for me, then, you know, it's it's not really working. I think I had more fun with that movie than I expected, but it also did fall right. pretty low in the rankings. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, now your number 38. I can see the list here, and I think I might need <gasps> to uh, defend myself a little bit here. I think I, I was I was getting thrown under the bus a minute ago. But what's no? Your number I was 38? I was feigning outrage. Uh, my number thirty eight <laughs> is Ghoulies. Also, uh, it's pretty low on my list. I don't think it's yeah. it's and I think the reason why is there's a lot there is a lot to like here. The oh, Beekler yeah. creature designs are super fun, super memorable. The cover art obviously is iconic. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. The score by Richard Band, we mentioned in the episode with with uh, Kevin, is just transcends the movie to me. Like I think the score is so much fun, more yeah. fun than the actual movie. It's nice to see young Mariska Hargitay mm-hmm. in there, and like it's there are things about it that are quirky and weird and memorable enough. But I just feel like uh, it, it it falls flat in delivering what I want from the Ghoulies themselves. Yeah. And yeah. so it just, it wasn't enough because there's a lot of Empire and Full Moon that, like, people who are listening to this list right now, they might be getting angry being like, how is that so low? How is that yeah, one so low? Yeah. Well, you're going to see when we get to the ones that are higher ranked, it's like, oh, yeah, because we have to rank this below another movie we'll talk about in 10, 15 minutes. Like, 
it's yeah. just you'll you'll see why. And this one for me just doesn't didn't quite work. That was my uh, number thirty eight. Steve, what's yours? Well, speaking of uh, some fan outrage here, uh, Demonic Toys is my number thirty eight, which is going to be low for a lot of people. I know a lot of. Our guests have cited that as one of their favorites, and it's certainly got one of the most iconic little stables of Tiny Terrors. But uh, I think outside of a few gonzo uh, weirdo moments in that movie, I found it very unpleasant, and I just deeply hate Baby Oopsie. Uh, I do not like spending time with that character, and uh, it, it takes up way too much real estate. Uh, I've got uh, bad news for you for the summer then, my friend. I know, I know. What's your 37? My 37 is Sorority Babes in the Slime Ball Bolorama. Not too, too much higher than you. I think you yeah, had yours like at five 44. Slots. Yeah, it's like four or five yeah, slots. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot to like about this movie. I will revisit it, I'm sure, at some point. Spider, Linnea Quigley's Spider is so much fun. Yeah. But I, I think this movie kind of overstays its welcome a little bit and J.R. Rawls was our guest in that movie and we mined a lot of info mm. uh, for that one and just the imp itself just leaves a little bit to be desired for me and there's there's a Hobgoblins-esque Willy Wonka-esque quality to it which I don't think is fully realized I like the I like the um, abandoned bowling alley setting yeah I think it's super cool but uh, some of the, the story beats of that movie just aren't as memorable. To me, it's like the bowling alley, Linnea Quigley in costume and character, and that cover are the three things that really stand out to me. Like, I will have Sorority Babes and the Slime Ball Bowlerama on a t-shirt. Yeah. But, but I don't know how soon I'm going to go back to revisit that movie. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Steve, I have to say, I took a gander. Mm-hmm. and. uh this is an interesting one for you coming up. I'm looking forward to see seeing why you slotted this one where you did. What's your number 37? My number 37 is Netherworld, uh, a movie uh, that we, I think we, we praised a lot of its aesthetic choices. I think it's got a cool setting and a kind of a cool vibe to it, but the plot just sort of slid right off my brain. Like nothing about this movie really stuck, you know, like, the, this should have been weirder. It should have been darker and stranger. And it's got a great effect with that killer hand, but mm-hmm. uh, it really does not connect for me. Well, not connecting is an important part of this. And I feel like for, for my number 36, again, is just not connecting with something, not having that nostalgia built into it because I know it's a fan favorite, but yeah. the first demonic toys yeah slotted down at number 36 but i should point out that now we're starting to get into what i would consider the middle of the pack and so we we kind of exercised our our bottom 14 or 15 and now we're getting into so from getting into kind of the qualified recommends yeah right and so you might be like you might think on 36 that seems very low on a ranking of 1 to 50 maybe but at the same time we're, we're in the middle era na- area now where a lot of these are neck and neck with one another it really was a question of like where do i put this one and i had to make an executive decision and this is not uh you know this is not a final list that is uh, printed in an unchangeable format like no i no. might very well revisit a movie like demonic toys and say you know, I was a little bit too harsh on that early on. Yeah. And I'm noticed things are I'm, uh, things are coming back to me about it and I I'm, I'm going to slide it up a couple slots. Like that's and, and and as the 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 list of movies grows, I mean it's number 36 for me out of 50 right now. It could end up being number like 50 out of 200. Yeah, for all exactly. You know, once this is done, which would then be in the top 25%. So we'll find I think out. You have to keep that in mind when because we're going to start getting into stuff where we're going to start saying more positive than negative. So for I the first so. 15 or so movies, we've been kind of skewing negative and why is this so low on our lists? But now we're going to start getting into some more positive stuff. And what's your 36? My number 36 is a surprising movie, uh, Ginger Dead Man 2, Passion of the Crust, a very sharp, very funny satire about Full Moon itself that is unfortunately saddled with just a fucking unwatchable uh, trash horror movie uh, around it uh, that's really poorly shot, uh, mean-spirited, racist, homophobic, uh, 
And that's just kind of indifferently sprinkled in with a pretty good, funny, like self-examination. Uh, so it had a lot of stuff that really surprised me. And then a lot of stuff that sadly played to the lower uh, uh, instincts of this era of full moon. Yeah. I, I don't entirely, <clears throat> I don't entirely disagree with that. I think it's very much of its time and it very much was trying to do something. And so I'm not saying that certain ways in which characters and situations are presented as excusable, but I can understand the mentality of let's try to offend everyone. I don't generally subscribe to appreciating no. that kind of humor and things that I seek out, but I do no. understand it a bit more here. And I think this one played a little bit better for me than it did for you. Yeah. Um, and also playing a little bit better for me than it did for you was my number 35 netherworld. Yeah. Not a lot better. But a lot better, better, but yeah, we covered that one. We covered that one. Yeah, I like the David Bryan uh, score. Yeah. I like the uh, New Orleans setting. And I thought what really made that one stand out to me was watching it. And Brian Smith, the uh, the wonderful uh, panel judge at New York City uh, Horror Film Festival screenwriting competition, was on for that one. And he had a lot of interesting stuff to say about it. And it, um, it was... I think watching it, it might have been the first one I watched on the Full Moon app. Yeah. And it was in the, the remastered one, which just looked absolutely beautiful. Like, it looked so much more slick than yeah. a, lot of, a lot of these movies have any right to. And, and for that reason, I, I think it shot up a little bit in my estimation. And some of the iconography of it, I, I think, is really good. But it, it is, you know, kind of where it's sitting here is bottom of the middle of the pack. And I'm yeah. okay with it. That decision. What about that 35 about right. for you, Steve? 35 for me is The Creeps, uh, which I feel like this is a movie that's literally about monsters that are half-baked, and I think that's kind of what the movie feels like. It's a little uh, undercooked. It uh, doesn't really have as much bite as it should, but it does have a genuinely fantastic performance from Phil Fondacaro as mm -hmm. a uh, small Dracula, which... Uh, kind of redeems a lot of that movie and just the whole universal monsters vibe of it is pretty charming to me doesn't all work but there's enough here i think that i liked uh what about number 34 for you so number 34 for me is slotted in this spot for right now but it might change uh it's one that i had a really hard time placing and i said it's gonna be closer to the middle than to the bottom but then when i saw other stuff it was competing with i said ah, you know I don't know if I can endorse this one as much. It's Ghoulies 2. Ghoulies 2. All right. We will we will get more into that in a minute because I think we had slightly different feelings on Goonies 2 or Ghoulies 2. But uh, yeah, yeah. The interesting low placement for you on that one. My number 34 is Prehysteria, which you already spoke about. Um, I think I ranked it a little higher just because I, I respect that it's a pretty slick, generally professionally made kids production. I think it's stupider than the uh, average kids fair of around that time but maybe i'm just seeing that with uh, rose colored glasses this might be about as stupid as a lot of the kids fair of this time but you know uh largely harmless not for me um how about 33 yeah, i would agree with you 33 for me is ginger dead man 2 passion mm -hmm. of the crust which is very interesting because if you would have asked me beforehand what where do you see yourself ranking some of these movies i would have probably imagined that this one not really knowing a lot about it would have been near the bottom yeah um and so just, the fact just that on it's, title alone yeah right the fact that it's sliding into number 33 of 50 you know not in the bottom 10 not even in the bottom 15 i think does speak to what works about it and you talked a little bit about what doesn't work about it and i think i weighed the positives a little bit heavier than you did yeah and i have a feeling that is probably the case for number 34 or number 33 i should say for you yeah and that I, i'm really curious uh what you put here and and why because i feel like again this we're going to start to see a bigger deviation yeah this is where i put uh, meridian uh kiss of the beast a movie that is really beautifully staged, beautifully shot. I know it's a movie that Charles Band is proud of. Uh, you know, I think he he was really going for something here. He's trying for a gothic romance, which is not mm -hmm. a genre that Full Moon tackles, uh, with a heaping helping of eroticism, courtesy of Sherilyn Fenn and Charlie Spradling, who are both very beautiful in this movie. I think there's just a lot of 
I'm bringing a lot of uh, modern politics into this movie and like mm-hmm. watching it with 2024 eyes or 2023 at the time when we recorded it. And uh, it is, it, it's just got too many problematic elements for it to be successful for me as like this kind of sexy bodice ripper of a movie. Uh, I, th- I think there's a lot of elements that work in this film, but it, is ultimately just a little bit too high on the ick factor. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm owning that. Like I know, I know it's maybe not fair to judge a movie by certain cultural standards, but like, it is also just something I can't really get around. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I did a little more, I worked a little bit harder to, to get around it and focus on the stuff about the movie that I liked. And I'm definitely not going to ignore the, the ick factor because I think it's very prevalent in it, but the fact that that has not been mentioned up to my number thirty-three yet should should give you an inkling that you know I, I hold it a, a little bit higher, and we'll yeah. talk about some of the positives when we get there. Um, my number thirty-two is the creeps, which you the already creeps. talked about. Again, it's uh, kind of uh, yeah a half-baked movie, but a fun Phil Fondacaro performance, and it's got some things. charm. It, it charm I think is important. I think charm is something you're going to see in a lot of the, the movies that we start to hit now because we're getting to the, I guess, clearing, close to clearing the bottom 20, but I don't really want to look at them as the bottom 20. I mean, yeah, there's a, kind of a big midway. middle. There's a big middle section here. Like, I think we've got a really well-established bottom five or 10 and well-established top five or 10. Yeah. And then I feel like in the middle of that, you can kind of switch. I, I feel like I'm going to be switching them around. You know, yeah. as as time goes on, but this is just where they stand as of right now. After having hit it, having just hit our fiftieth movie, um, where what did you slide into number thirty two for you? Thirty two for me, and we could start cruising through some of these because some of the now we're kind of getting into the area where we've we've talked a lot about um, these movies when we were consistently ranking. You know, mm. I've, which I don't know what that says that like some of our more recent episodes are a little more low ranked, but I don't know. We'll we'll see what that means. My number 32 is Lurking Fear, uh, which I think is a movie that goes a lot lower on a lot of Full Moon fans ranking or, or just it doesn't really register because it's kind of a it's kind of a second or third rate Lovecraft adaptation. But um, I don't know. I kind of enjoyed this. The, the vibe of it. I liked the whole concept of a crime movie that just sort of wandered into mm-hmm. a horror movie. And uh, there's there's some fun performances here and some good creature design. So I don't know. I, it, I kind of enjoyed Lurking Fear. It ranked higher for me, one place higher. One place it higher, was my, 31. It was my number 31, Lurking yeah. Fear, actually. Uh, it's a C. Courtney Joyner movie. It's got jo- uh, John Finch and mm-hmm. uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Combs. Combs and yeah. it's a Lovecraft adaptation. And there's a lot of fun stuff. And it's occasionally plotting and boring and a little unfocused. But overall, I, I thought... A pretty modest uh, production and a pretty yeah. decent little adaptation. I may I may go back to it at some point in the f- in the future. Yeah, why not? Uh, number thirty one for me is Transfers Two: The Return of Jack Death. Uh, it's basically just let's make Transfers again, but with lower production values and a uh, kind of right. slower pacing. You know, that was sort of where I landed on that one. I, it's not without its fun. I think I enjoy the Transfers series enough that. And Tim Thomerson is just always a delight, but it is mm-hmm. the lowest ranked of the Transfers movies we've watched so far. Uh, of the ones we've watched so far? Absolutely. Yeah. I would say the same for me. It hasn't appeared on my list yet, and it's not going to appear yet for uh, number 30, which for me it might ruffle some feathers. It's Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm, uh, Ailish is in the other room right now cringing. You know, she can just feel it. Like she's, uh, she, she can sense that like someone's saying something bad about cannibal women. But I'm not which... really saying anything too bad about it. No. Like, yes, I'm sliding it number 30 out of 50, but it's also, there's a lot of it that works. There's some of it that doesn't work. It makes me look at Bill Maher for longer than I want to look at Bill Maher. It's really true. Hold, hold that against it. Um, it is successful in a lot of ways, unsuccessful in others. Uh, I will probably watch it again at some point uh, because I do think there there's a lot of good here. But I think that this is the kind of hairs we have to split now when we start getting into these movies because I could have this was number 30 for me. It could have very easily been number 23 or number 22. Like I had to, you know, really figure out 
how to make these placements meaningful. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that's one that people would be like, oh, no, that's a pretty successful movie. Should be higher up. Maybe. Maybe. But I feel like 30 is fine. But uh, we're going to we're gonna get into few here where we're going to skew a little bit. So I'm looking forward to this. A little bit, yeah. My, my number 30 is going to be Creepazoids, which you already covered a little bit. I think I had a little bit more fun with that one just because I like bad monster That's movies. That's got to be the biggest know. discrepancy so far, right? Your number yeah. 30 and my number 43, 13 places, yeah. Yeah, well, I think we might have our biggest discrepancy yet with your number 29, actually. what, what is uh, This is surprising uh, where this landed for you. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to adjust this. Yeah, uh, I'm going to change this one to 20. I'm going to change this one to 27. Okay. So for a little inside baseball there to listeners, this was not how it appeared on my list, but I'm going to change uh, two, of, two of them around. Uh, okay. My number 29 is Meridian, Kiss of okay. the Beast. Um, and I, I just think that it was really beautifully shot but problematic and but i thought there were some big swings taken here and again it was a product of a very different time and i think because of that it's i i forgive is not the right word but i can view it with a 1990 lens yeah um to some extent i still winced at the sheer amount of unconsensual sex and how it's presented as being romantic yeah uh in this movie but i but i do think that for an early full moon movie with uh taking on uh genres that were not typically tapped into i think it's 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 successful in in a lot of ways like i think I, and I feel like it's kind of, you know, it's it's middle of the pack and there's probably people listening who think it should be all the way at the bottom because of some of the uh, narrative beats that happen. And I don't entirely disagree with you, but I'm going to yeah. place it in the middle because I do think there is artistry here and there is an attempt to make something romantic. I just think that the sensibilities of 1989, 1990 come through really hard and it's hard yeah. to appraise with a modern lens. Well, my number 29 is uh doll man, but if this were a list of movies, I would like to see uh, most remade. Uh, this would be number one because I think this is a really fun, funny idea for a movie that I think you could get a lot out of. And I'm just a little frustrated that this movie is not funny, uh, funnier or campier or more exciting than it is. A lot of it are budget limitations. A lot of it are Alfred Pune's uh, admitted limitations as a director and the fact that he was making this at the same time as Arcade, you know, so he was not really focused on either project. Um, Tim Thomerson carries this a long way, but I feel like if you could make like a slick, big budget uh, production of this movie, I think it'd be so fun. Um, and I just wish they kind of stuck the landing a little bit better here. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with you. It's a lot higher up on my list than it is on yours, but I don't disagree with the points that you just made. Yeah. And similarly to everything you said before, I echo it for my number 28, which is mm-hmm. Trancers 2, The Return of Jack Death. Yeah. The the least of the, of the three Trancers movies we've covered so far on the show. And uh, you're probably, I would imagine, hitting a movie that I hit already for your number 28. What do you have there? I have Ghoulies 2, which mm. uh, I have slightly higher than yours, not by too much. But uh, I, I did, I think I maybe gave it an extra boost just because of how much more I liked it than the first one. I think it's just a more complete movie and it's uh, a more of what you kind of want from a movie like this. But yeah, still, still not top tier, but I think it is a noted improvement. And I, um, I agree with you. I think it's a noted improvement too. I mean, it moved up about five spots in my list from the first movie, but yeah. uh, not you know not to the top or anything like that. I do think you get some fun gross out scenes. The Beekler effects are great, and I do yeah. think that we the goody the the ghoulies are utilized more to, in what you want. I don't. I think it's wholly successful, but I do think that there's stuff about it that that works. And again, the Ghoulies one and two episode, while neither one ranks in the top half of our movies to this point, super fun episode to record. That brings us to number twenty-seven. Which yeah, all right, yeah. I let's... have to do. I have some splaining to do. All right, let's do it. Number twenty-seven. I have the first Puppet Master as number twenty-seven. 
on my list. Surprisingly low. Surprisingly low, I have to say. Yeah, and it's not because I think it's a bad movie. I think it has the misfortune of being followed by two sequels we covered that I really think very highly of. And so it automatically got pushed down in the list, in my estimation. Like, I feel like if I'm going to watch a Puppet Master movie, I, I might go back and put the first one on first. But but really, my my allegiances lie with the first two sequels and we'll be yeah. covering four and five sometime in the near future also. Um, and so it kind of forced it below because I can scratch my puppet master itch elsewhere. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's a bad movie. I think it's actually a, a pretty decent movie. Yeah. Um, but, it, but if I'm going puppet master, we'll, we'll get to later on what I'm choosing and, and why. Be- and uh, I also caught a glimpse, Steve, and I got to say, we're at a disagreement here for your number 27, too. And I'm I was cracking surprised my to... knuckles in anticipation for you to explain why I, I was God's name this. this is so low. Yeah, I was a little surprised, too, that there's such a disparity because I have Dr. Mordred at number 27. You know, I'm a I think I'm a big Marvel Comics fan. I'm a big Doctor Strange fan, and I really appreciate what they're going for. Uh, and I love Jeffrey Combs as well. I, I just feel like this movie while it's so cool to give Jeffrey Combs like a leading role in a superhero movie, like who the fuck else is going to do that? That's so cool. I don't feel like he gets to embrace the uh, weird singularity that is the Jeffrey Combs performance. I think he has to tamp down a lot of his weird, raw, natural charisma. And I think the movie just sort of doesn't know where to go, but Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the attempt at this and we'll, we'll go back into that again. Um, Because with with your number 26, we are uh, uh, talking about something fairly recent. Yeah, my number 26 is the most recent movie that we've covered on the show, 1988's Ghost Town. One of the last Empire pictures. And that we recorded it an hour ago. Yeah, less than an hour ago. (laughs) A little inside baseball for people there. Um, uh, And we said on that show that I think Brad, our guest, Brad Hansen, said, uh, nicely shot, no plot. Yeah, Which good way to put it. I, I think is a really good, a really smart way to put it because there's not a lot of narrative beats in that movie to really go over. But the no. aesthetic is super cool. The the genre bending of a, a horror movie, uh, ghost movie with Western, fun, memorable artwork. Uh, I will probably watch it again at some point, see if I can't yeah. mine a little bit more out of the plot than I got through my first watch uh, when we were uh, for in, in anticipation of recording the episode. But... That's my number 26, and what's yours? My number 26 is The Priest Pisser. Oh, I'm sorry. That's uh, Rawhead Rex. I'm sorry I got my alliterative titles mixed up. But Rawhead Rex, uh, based on the Clive Barker story, featuring a big, goofy-looking troll that uh, probably should have had a little bit less screen time. I'm rarely going to say that about a monster movie, you know, but this is a design that probably would have been better kept in some shadows rather than uh, a nice sunny bucolic Irish countryside. Uh, still a lot of fun stuff in there. And uh, I think it's a pretty well paced, like well shot movie overall, but that, that creature design hurts the movie a bit. Uh, I, how I agree. Your... I, would, I yeah. agree with you, even though it's higher up on the list. Now I just want to say one thing. So I'm getting yeah. to my number 25 here. So mm-hmm. we're getting to the top half yeah. of this list. And I'm just going to come right out and say, I like all of these movies. Yeah. Like everything that we're going to talk about now, you might take umbrage with the number, the ranking, but just know that this was, especially in this patch of movies was very hard to do Yeah, because I, I genuinely like all of these movies. And so if I have one above another, it doesn't mean that I think it's head and shoulders above it. It's probably maybe eked it out for reasons that I'll talk about, but it should be noted that we're in the middle. We're smack dab in the middle right now. And everything uh, from 25 to number one is something that I genuinely endorse and recommend and yeah. will, will to, to, to varying degrees. And so we'll, we'll talk about why. But my number 25 is another movie that you might not have realized we actually covered. Uh, it is 1999's Ragdoll. And we were guests on the Movie Dumpster podcast. They were a guest on our show for Demonic Toys 2. Uh, we were on their show for the episode on Ragdoll, a movie that we really liked, I think, more than any of us were expecting to like. And you can jump onto Movie Dumpster's uh, page and find 
that episode on their main feed of podcasts. And uh, yeah, it's right smack dab in the middle for me. A lot yeah. to like about it. Um, we we talk about the some of the characterization in that movie. And even though it is ultra, ultra cheap, probably among the cheapest we've even talked about so far in this yeah. whole in this uh, stack of movies we've been covering it still manages to tell a pretty compelling story and uh, uh, we'll talk more about it because you haven't mentioned it yet so I have not mentioned coming it up yet. later we'll, on in your list we will get to it uh, another first mention for my 25 my smack in the middle is bad channels uh, directed by Ted Nicolau with you know it, it's it's a really weird movie it's very cheap and kind of odd looking and uh, it has some pacing issues but it's got one of the most bizarre hooks of any full moon movie. You know, the fact that you get sucked into these music videos, some of which are genuinely odd. Uh, and it's it's just kind of a fun watch. You know, it's like a, it's a good time. You know, we'll we'll elaborate more when we get to yours. But uh, your number 24 is another uh, that might surprise people a bit. My number 24, again, might surprise people because you might think this is pretty low on the list. It's a franchise movie. It's the first movie in a franchise. But again, the same kind of defense I came to for Puppet Master is what I'm going to come here. It's like what the next couple of sequels will bring. It's the first subspecies. Yeah. So I have subspecies at number 24. I think it's a pretty good movie. It's a good concept, uh, nice location, not fully fleshed out. I think we yeah. talked about that on the episode, how I felt like there was a lot more that they can do with it. And they made... Uh, a decent movie. The first movie suffers by leaning too heavily into the subspecies themselves, and that will be rectified later on. So yeah. again, a movie and a franchise that I like, and I, I would say definitely check out subspecies, although it is falling relatively far down, you know, number 24 on my list. I still recommend it. Steve, what about you? What's your number 24? My number 24 is Cellar Dweller, directed by John Carl Beekler. A uh, fun uh, movie set in a weird artist compound. There's a lot of uh, heavy uh, uh, EC Comics kind of vibe to it, which I really enjoyed. Uh, yeah, I had a good time with Cellar Dweller. Yeah, I have Cellar Dweller slightly higher up, so we'll talk a little bit more about some of the specifics when we get there. Uh, number 23 for me is a movie that I enjoyed quite a bit. We had an amazing time talking to the star of that movie and getting a whole bunch of insight into what went into getting the movie made. It's an mm -hmm. anthology movie, so it showcased a bunch of people's particular work and style. It's The Dungeon Master from 1984. Absolutely. The, uh, I believe the very first of the True Empire productions. And uh, Jeffrey Byron was amazing on that episode. So much fun recording that one. And again... It might be number 23 on my list, but it's a movie I would tell people that they definitely should check out, especially if you want to see the early footprint of some of the yeah. people who've come to be major players in, in Empire and Full Moon and beyond. That one's the Rosetta Stone. There's just so many different Full Moon people came from the Dungeon Master. Uh, my number 23 you already mentioned is Ghost Town. Uh, I think you put it, but, well, you and Brad put, put it uh, as well as we could. Uh, well, beautifully shot, no plot. Uh, it, it was a fun little cultural oddity and it's definitely got some vibes out the butt, but, uh, it doesn't totally come together, but I still had a good time watching that one. How about your, what are we at? We're at 22, 22. My 22 is raw head Rex. I like oh, raw head Rex a little bit more than you did. Again, the creature design is goofy as hell and it's lit way too, too often. I think this, there, there should have been a lot of work in the shadows, keeping this thing hidden a little bit, but a lot of the, Irish countryside stuff works for me in that movie. And I think it's kind of got, it, it, it dips its toe a little bit into folk horror more so than some of these other movies do. And I thought there was a, a lot of it and it's a Clive Barker story. So yeah, it has a lot going for it. Poor creature design, uh, you know, knocks it a, a little bit, but I think Rawhead Rex is a, a fun watch. I'll probably revisit it at uh, some point. And that's oh, why yeah. it's sitting at number 22 for me and uh what about you steve 22 my number 22 is transfers three death lives great subtitle a uh, really fun movie i think you know the first transfers sequel suffered from trying to figure out what a transfers movie in the full moon era is going to look like transfers sure. three is where they kind of figure it out where it's like all right so we can't really keep doing this terminator angle let's just make you doctor who let's just make you fly around space meet weird aliens mm -hmm. solve crimes and have a good time i think it's the right direction to take that movie 
And you could just feel that that one has more juice and more energy to it than uh, Trancers 2. So, Death Lives. Uh, how about I, 21 for you? I agree with you 100%. My 21 is Cellar Dweller. So just Cellar a couple Dweller. of places on the list ahead of you. Uh, I think the EC comic stuff is great. I think the Jeffrey Combs cameo is wonderful. I think some of the avant-garde like art that's going on uh, in this movie is super fun. It's yeah. just quirk, quirky and it's memorable. And the the cellar dweller himself, played by Michael Deke, is one of John Carl Beekler's single greatest effects pieces. So it's very it, well it, done. It, it it narrowly made my top twenty, but just missed it uh but yeah. still a super fun movie that i i would recommend again like kind of light on plot but but that's okay i think yeah. the aesthetics are so strong in that one uh number 21 for me in a huge victory for my girlfriend is cannibal women in the avocado jungle of death the fact that it got that close to my top 20 while still featuring bill maher so very heavily is quite an accomplishment. I think it, it this movie connected a little bit more with me on this most recent watch. Like, despite the Bill Maher of it all, there is a pretty sharp and funny satire going on here. And it's just unique to have this kind of a comedy in the Full Moon Empire catalog. We talk about a lot of genre stuff. We talk about very few straight comedies. And this is a straight comedy in, like, a Zucker Brothers, like, Kentucky Fried movie kind of way. Uh, and I had a I had a decent time with it, you know. I had I had some fun with it. How about your no, uh... the comedy works? The comedy works in a lot of places. It really, really does. It does. I do think it it's does. a pretty it's a pretty funny movie at, it's, at times. It's a it's a comedy central staple for a reason. I think. Yeah. Oh, it sure was. Yeah. Uh, my number twenty is Trancers Three. Death lives. He does um, indeed. Yeah, I I echo everything that you said about that. I think they figured out a way to make transfers work as a full moon property after that and that feels less of a rehash of the first movie and more something of its own and we i i had fun with transfers three more so than than transfers two and i think um we maybe we're all in agreement on the episode we recorded the transfers two and three with eric hansen of the cradle to the grave podcast mm -hmm. and i think he he was saying i think he actually was kind of saying that some of the slickness of part three and some of the choices was what he wasn't necessarily looking for in a transfers movie, but I think he came on the side of three being better than two, but it had, it had w what I was looking for. And we are uh, into the top 20 now, Steve. So I'm really yeah. curious what's going to be the same and what's going to be different here. What's your number 20? My number 20 is Stuart Gordon's the pit and the pendulum. The first Gordon film that has come onto our list so far. So you can tell we hold him in pretty high esteem you know, The Pit and the Pendulum, uh, I, I recently joked, we were on an episode of uh, 302010 where we were talking about uh, Escape from New York, and I joked that that movie had the least moisturized cast in the history of film, and I think Pit and the Pendulum might compete with that. Just in terms of pure, craggy character actor goodness, it is overflowing. I love the vibes of it. This is shot in uh, Charles Fan's actual castle, so you have all of those uh, accurate details and you have Lance Henriksen really going for it. This does suffer from being a feature length adaptation of a short story. That is always a little bit of a hard sell to uh, work, but I, I think it's a super fun movie. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I liked Pit and the Pendulum quite a bit. Actually, it was hard for me to place on this list and it, it did make my top 20. I'm not getting to it yet, but my number 19 is Terror Vision. Or no, I'm oh, sorry. My no. number 19 is not Terror Vision. I lied. It's Oblivion. It is. So, yeah. A uh, lot of fun. We had a, a, a great time talking to Sam Irvin, the director of Oblivion. Mm -hmm. uh, Dylan, Dylan James Quarles was on here talking about that movie. And it's just a space Western comedy. Just throw a bunch of shit at the wall and see what sticks. And some of it is really broad and really silly to the point where it almost just looks like a a failed pilot to a TV show, but I get such an enjoyment out of it. I, I really had, had a great time with it and I will yeah. definitely pop it on again in the future. I mean, my number 19 is uh, ranked highly for a lot of the same reasons. This is a genre mashup that throws a lot of shit to the wall. Some of it sticks, some of it doesn't, but I appreciate the effort. Uh, it's arena from 1989, uh, which is a uh, alien boxing movie, uh, which is a really fun concept. It, the, the script was a bit mangled. I know there was definitely some uh, behind-the-scenes struggles on that movie, but uh, really fun, uh, and I, I really had a good time talking about that one. Um, oh, what is your 18? 
So I think I just uh, gave away my, what my number 18 <laughs> was. It's TerraVision. Um, it Ted Nicolaou's TerraVision. Really just super fun, 80s excess, um, a little uh, satire, you know, of the consumer culture of the time. Uh, Garrett Graham and Mary Warrenov mm-hmm. and a bunch of oh, very lavish uh, swingers mansion where that takes place. Just a, a ton of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had a great time recording that episode with Patrick Hamilton from mm-hmm. Kill by Kill. Um, and if you're listeners of ours, you heard that one a few weeks ago. And Such a fun uh, one. yeah, that one slid its way into my top 20 at number 18. What about you? My 18, which might surprise a lot of people, is Ragdoll. Again, we mentioned that we uh, we discussed that on uh, the Movie Dumpster podcast. That was a first time watch for uh, both of us. It was one that I was a, kind of. I don't know, not super looking forward to. That's not my favorite era of Full Moon. And uh, it, it looked like it might have been a little spotty. But I thought that was a movie that was surprisingly well paced, uh, well acted. And it had a lot more going on than I was expecting it to. The Tiny Terror element of it is pretty campy and silly and sort of disposable. But like a lot of Ted Nicolau movies, it airs on the side of having plot and character. Um, if you can't really nail the special effects. So I appreciated that about a Ragdoll. Uh, what's your 17? My 17. Now we're getting into what, what I consider to be the top tier yeah. full moon stuff. Although I think Ob- Oblivion probably in my starting with my number 19 is probably where I really feel like that's the case. But yeah. uh, for me, it's Puppet Master 2. My number yeah. 18 is Puppet Master t- or 17 or 17. 17. Is Puppet Master 2. And that's, uh, I thought, super fun, kind of like a Universal Monsters take on Puppet Master. I thought the introduction um of blaze in that movie is such a cool scene yeah the, the the scene with blade who is uh the the stop motion effect of him jumping off the bed and running just so memorable so iconic yeah uh and you know and we got to talk about that with nat bremer who i mean if there's someone in the world who knows more about puppet master i would like to meet them because i don't we've think said it he wrote, exists he wrote the and, book yeah, and we'll get to – we can talk a little bit more about it when it we find it on your list, but where mm-hmm. are you sitting now at number uh, 17? Number 17 is The Dungeon Master, a film you talked about already. Uh, I think I said on the show, had I discovered this movie like on a basic cable or something when I was eight years old, it would have been my world. Uh, it just combined so many of my interests and the aesthetics of the time in a way that I really loved, and I had a, a great time talking to Jeffrey about that one. Yeah, for uh, my number 16, I don't have a lot more to echo than what you said before. No, no. Other than I just think I liked it more than you did. I don't dis- disagree with a lot of the points you made. But for number 16 for me is Dollman. I consider Dollman to be up there in terms of the full moon echelon. And so you, one of our biggest things, gaps, the things yeah. that you pointed out about, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that they aren't true, but I just like this movie a lot more than you do. I think. Yeah, no, it's fair. Uh, my number 16 is the original subspecies, uh, which you had a few slots lower. You know, I think we've we've discussed that in detail, both uh, on the episode about this and uh, on our interviews with uh, Denise Duff and Kevin Sirtis and with uh, um, uh, with Ted Nicolau, the director. You know, I think all of them kind of agree that the movie, the series didn't really super find its footing until the next entry. But uh, subspecies has a lot to recommend. Uh, and how about well, your number 15 brings us to the 16? top the 15. No, 15 yeah it is brings 15. us to Sorry. the top 15 uh for me it's pit in the pendulum yeah ranked it a, a, a bit higher than you did i think you had it at number 20 yeah um five spaces or so really liked it really really thought it was good it was a pretty ambitious period piece for a low budget company like full moon for sure lots of craggly actors some great oliver reed lance henriksen obviously is yeah. amazing but uh yeah, that's uh, Pit in the Pendulum for me. My number 15, what about you? Well, on my list, the Puppet Master series makes its debut. Number 15 is the original Puppet Master, a movie with uh, a lot of nice production value, and it kind of set the tempo for a lot of Full Moon movies. I do think it's a little slow, and I think the series would find its footing a little bit as it went on. But uh, number, I think there's still a lot to recommend in that movie, and it just kind of kicked off everything. Um all right, now we're getting into your your number 14, which uh, uh, one of our wildest discoveries. 
Yeah, so number 14 is Shrunken Heads. And even though you might say 14, wow, like there's really 13 Empire and Full Moon movies that you guys did that you're rating above that. Yes, however, Shrunken Heads is amazing. And yeah. you should definitely so watch it. Uh, we were lucky enough to have Grady Hendrix join us on that episode. Just a fantastic discussion uh, of just a wild batshit movie uh if you're listening to us for the first time now and you're hearing us rank these movies but you never actually watched shrunken heads or listened to our episode on shrunken heads like please do that immediately and we'll, we'll talk about a couple of the plot beats when we get there whenever this makes its uh, appearance in steve's list which it seems is a little higher up a little higher what is little, your 14 my my 14 keeping them together is puppet master 2 which i think mm has a lot of the same problems as the first movie, but I like that it uh, upped the ante a little bit. It has a little bit of a swifter pace, and it has genuinely the best special effects maybe of any um, full moon movie. Just that that scene alone, that Dave Allen stop motion, is undeniably fantastic and uh, really impressive that they pulled it off. Uh, so, so now my, let's go your 13, lucky 13. My lucky 13 is Dr. Mordred. Yeah. So much higher up on the list than it was for you. I thought I like that. I, I like the place. Fun. I like the place where it averages out. You know, if we add mine and yours, I think maybe you know that's that. that I, I'm comfortable with that average. That's fair, and I kind yeah. of feel like uh, you know we. It is very. It's lavish and it's lush and it looks really good and it's you know plot wise it's a little underbaked and we talked in the episode with uh, Cecil Trachenberg from Good Bad Flicks about how. There were proposed sequels to that movie that all sounded super cool, and it's kind of a bummer that we didn't get the extended universe of, of Dr. Mordrew. But I do like that that movie as a standalone movie. What's your 13, Steve? My 13, uh, you already mentioned it. It's Oblivion. Uh, you know, I love a good genre mashup. I love something that, uh, that... That movie is also intentionally funny in a way that I don't think it's been given credit for. I think people assumed it was just sort of accidentally funny. That movie is expressly a comedy and I think it's a fairly successful one in its, all of its cheese and all of its ambitions and weirdness. I, we I would, I'm inclined to agree with you in my number 12, another big discrepancy. I think another yeah. 13 point or so deviation for us, bad channels. Technical, yeah. it was bad channels. Uh, Becky Dark was on our episode and she was amazing. And I just thought there's so much weirdness. And I, I think Ted Nicolau has such a reverence for shooting music and shooting bands. And it's just such an odd premise for a movie and, and utilizing the radio station not unlike the way it utilized a satellite in terror vision um but i think there was just so much to like here it's just yeah it, it is <clears throat> like you mentioned it, uh, an hd version of this doesn't exist probably for the better yeah 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 probably my number 12 is terror vision which we already discussed a little bit i think just a a weird and woolly satire with a lot of gross monster designs mm -hmm. and some funny campy performances i think uh yeah we, we we had a great discussion with patrick and with ted about that so we are uh what are we at we're at number 11 now and we are aligned we we've we found an exact we are we are exactly lined up on our number 11. probably not maybe not the last time that this is going to happen yeah but uh, number 11 for both of us, I believe, is Intruder, 1989's yeah. Intruder, which was an Empire distribution, very end of Empire, right around the time that the company was crumbling. But super fun grocery store sl set slasher movie with, um, you know, just the footprints of a bunch of people that would go on to be, you know, s make such an indelible mark on the 1990s. You got your Raimis in there, Scott Spiegel, Lawrence Bender, Roger Avery, all those people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, we, you know, we did our episode on that with Mike Munzer recently, which you guys probably all heard and yeah. had a lot of generally nice things to say about it. And I feel like that, you know, it just, it just missed the top 10 for both of us. What made the top 10? Yeah, I'll, well, let's let's kick it off for you. Your, your number 10. Uh, coming in, uh, yeah. Uh, what, where, where do you, where did you land on with that one? So my number ten is Stuart Gordon's Robot Jocks, mm -hmm. and you know, Robot Jocks. Our episode was so much fun with John Tarani, bringing so much knowledge of, of that movie to the forefront for us. Uh, but I think it is a, you know, a fighting robot movie done about as well as a fighting robot movie can be done, and it's yeah. uh, it, it made my top ten. Like, re really here. 
for the top 10 of these 50 are, are movies that now we're moving into territory where I'm like, not only are these movies I kind of like and endorse, but it's like, these are movies I recommend to people. These are movies I watch frequently. These are movies that I will always go to bat for as being, you know, uh, uh, not just at the top of a list of Empire and Full Moon, but of stuff that I genuinely really, really love. And I, I yeah. genuinely do love Robot Jocks. And was, was Robot Jocks your number 10 too, Steve? It was not, but my it's it, it's in there. I'll let you know. It is in my top ten. My number ten is uh, Psychos in Love, a true cult film. Like in the in the purest sense of the word, this is a cult film uh, that is so much more ambitious and inventive and knowing and smart and funny than you would expect from a movie like this. It's definitely one of our weirdest and. Uh, dare I say, artiest movies that we've covered on this show in its own uh, unambitious, unpretentious way. Or not Steve, unambitious, complete, unpretentious, yeah. Ag- I'm in complete agree with, agreement with you so much so that it's my number nine movie. There it is, number nine, Psychos in Love. Yeah, a, a real, a movie that was not on my radar and would not mm-hmm. have been had we not done this show, and I'm so glad I sought it out and saw it. Right, thanks to Matt Desiderio for bringing it to our attention because now it's made it into the pantheon of movies that I will gladly introduce to other people and, and pop on from time to time. I don't know if I even told you, but uh, a friend of mine listened to that episode and then he and his husband went and had a date night where they watched uh, Psychos in Love and they loved Love it. it. Like, I mean, how great is that? Like, that that people are seeking that out as a date movie. Love it. Uh, my number nine is Tourist Trap, a truly bizarre, fun, weird slasher film that's uh, one of the earlier movies that we've covered on this list. And... Uh, really striking like genuinely pretty scary in a couple points mm-hmm. despite not being like an explicit or super gory movie but uh yeah. there's some solid chills uh i and agree it's with a, you yeah so much so that it is higher up on my list it is yeah. not my number nine it's not even my number eight my number eight is another surprise movie one that i knew very little about was apprehensive going in completely enamored with and i don't think you know you probably are going to disagree with me at all no blood dolls blood dolls yeah uh, uh truly well well we'll get to it we'll get to it i'll, I'll have more to say on that because my number eight is shrunken heads which you've already covered but mm-hmm. just genuinely a movie i want to show to as many people as possible just because i don't think they'll believe me that it exists like i don't think they'll believe if they if i describe that movie to anybody i think they would think i was making it up uh, and that's kind of the best sort of B genre movie that you can hope for. Uh, and I had just such a blast watching that. Well, I would use that description to describe my number seven, which is Arena. I think there this you go. is about as good a B movie with an amazing concept, you know, aliens fighting in a giant uh, arena or gauntlet for supremacy. I think it's handled uh, in such a fantastic way. Fun character actors, great design, screaming mad George effects, and Peter Manugian's arena. That was my number seven. And we're getting down to the nitty gritty here, Steve. What have you got? Well, my number seven is going to be a little movie called Castle Freak. Uh, Definitely the hardest, gnarliest uh, horror movie, like in the purest sense that we have talked about on this show, a movie that I think has scarred people, you know, for some of the imagery that is in this film. But it's really effective. It's really well shot, well acted. And uh, uh, it's, you know, I, we're always a fan of uh, H.P. Lovecraft stories being taken away from H.P. Lovecraft. And this is an exact perfect example of what that does. And it kind of closes out the amazing trilogy of Barbara Crampton, Jeffrey Combs, Stuart Gordon co-productions. And uh, naturally, we spoke to Stuart Wellington on that episode. Uh, Stuart's a great dude, and he really enhanced that experience, I think, for me, too. Yeah, and that experience didn't need a whole lot of enhancing for me because I have Castle Freak at my number six. Yeah. So very, very close there. And yeah, everything that you just said about it, I think I fully uh, echo everything there. Great bookend to the that trilogy of Lovecraft movies with Barbara Crampton and Jeffrey Combs. Just so much fun. We're getting uh, it. We're, oh, we're, we're, you're, we're, you we're got getting number the six here. here. And we're to the number yeah. six, a movie I'm surprised I have lower than you because I feel like I really vibed with this movie. It's Trancers. It's the original Trancers, one of the first episodes that we did of the show. Uh, and this movie was just a real discovery for me. I think it's it's so fun. It, it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's got kind of like a Terminator light vibe. It's got a genuine mm-hmm. charm to it. 
And I, I just I enjoyed the hell out of transfers. I'll, I'll, I'll happily watch that again. Oh, yeah. And we are now in our top five. Here we are. And We've so my it. number five is one that you've spoken about already. Tourist Trap. Yeah. I genuinely really like Tourist Trap. Chuck Connors is so memorable. Mm -hmm. in it, and I just think it's creepy. The Pino DiNaggio score is great. Uh, so good. Danny Torkel, our guest, was a really fun guest. And we just, I felt like, had uh, a really good time talking about that movie. And I think I've, I've watched it even again since we've recorded the episode. So it's it's one that I'll I'll pop on and uh, it it made it into my top five. I mean I love Castle Freak, I love yeah. Arena, I love Blood Dolls, but it Taurus Trap eked past them to make it into my top five. What about you for number five? Uh, well, make it into my top five is one you already listed. Uh, Robot Jocks, it's, uh, a real departure for the kind of movie that we're talking about. It's it's uh, literal rock'em sock'em robots with some great miniature work, some really. Uh, over-exaggerated uh, performances, R.I.P. Gary Graham. Uh, he was great in that movie. Um, you know, but it set the tone. Like, it really does feel like Pacific Rim is kind of the big budget iteration of what Robot Jocks did. And it's a surprisingly engaging, like, sports drama uh, with giant robots. And I had so much fun with it. How about it's your so number good. four? My number four is Trancers. And yes, I do is. have it higher than you. I really genuinely love Trancers. I will. It's a movie that's made it into my uh, repeated watchings. Yeah. So it's, it's one that I'll throw on from time to time. I mean, it's so short. It's like 75 minutes. It's like, it's like taking a breath, you know? Absolutely. And <laughs> yeah. And it's just, I, I always am struck by how smart some of the plotting of the movie is like, and, and how creative it is. And then that it's a Christmas movie. Yeah. Made it into my Christmas rotation. Uh, but it's it's so much fun. And Tim Thomerson is just an absolute delight. In he all always of is. He's a delight. He's the one, you know, the one factor that doesn't change where he's been a delight in all of these movies that yeah, he's absolutely. been in that we've talked about him in, which is multiple ones. Uh, and no, I just, I, I really love Transfers. It's made its way to not just the near the top of my full moon and empire list for the movie for the for the show but just m movies that i love in general and have such a reverence for it and i think it's uh it, there's such little creative touches to that movie that just elevate it from what could have been strictly you know b movie fair like it's a b movie that yeah. plays like an a a movie in a lot of ways absolutely it is uh, my number four is a B movie that plays very, very much like a B movie, and that's Blood Dolls. Uh, you covered it already, but this was a real surprise. It was one of those uh, movies where, like, every fifteen seconds, there would be some jaw-dropping new weird detail, and I just I love when movies can give that to me and just a consistent, steady drip of weirdness. Uh, it feels unhinged and creatively freed in a way mm -hmm. that a lot of other Charles Band movies don't. And uh, I just had, it's such an infectious, weird, fun, campy movie. Uh, I had a great time with Blood Dolls. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I w would not have guessed in a million years that if we were sitting here doing this ranking at this time after 50 movies before we did the episode that Blood Dolls would be in both of our top 10. Yeah, it was uh, not on my radar until we talked about it. No, nah, but a movie that was on my radar that slides in at number three for me, which I had a feeling, which I knew from the very beginning was going to be somewhere near the top when all is said and done, Puppet Master 3, Toulon's Revenge. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to have more to say on that in a minute, just like you'll have more to say on my number three, which is Bloodstone Subspecies mm. 2. Uh, well, why, why don't why don't we get into these? We can we can double up because we just have those two reversed. Like right. I, have, so my, I have Subspecies 2 at number three. You have it at number two. That's right. So I have, I have Bloodstone Subspecies 2 at number two and Puppet Master 3 at number three. You have them switched. Mm -hmm. um, Puppet Master 3, in my opinion, definitely the best in the series. Really amazing to me how they can take such an odd swing and like really yeah. lean into making this thing a period piece and bringing in the, the Nazi subplot here more fleshed out more. Uh, it had been introduced already, but here it's really front and center. I think this movie manages to, and I think it's in addition to probably being the best directorial job of David Dakota. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, for as, for as much, you know, he, he does kind of populate the bottom half of both of our lists, you know, including the literally the very, very bottom ones, but this is what he is capable of. Like, I think that uh, puppet master three, which is my number two is really an accomplished uh emotional mm -hmm. movie that kind of and that's guy rolf i think too 
as yeah. to, as Toulon as a difference maker here. Oh, absolutely. But like it, it's it feels much more thoughtful than you would expect from a puppet master movie. It recontextualizes the characters in an interesting way that has implications for the future of the series. Uh, and I, I thought it was very accomplished. And the same could be said for Subspecies 2, which we, we've we spoken to many of the people involved in the making of that movie. And uh, just they're all kind of in agreement. There was just some sort of weird synergy that came together. It's Subspecies 1 was an ambitious, interesting project that was plagued by a lot of production issues and just a lot of like inconsistencies in tone. And this is where Ted Nicolau kind of takes the reins of this series does away with a lot of the foo for all, just makes it a gothic vampire mm-hmm. drama absolutely with amazing authentic romanian settings and he finds a cast that really works for him he finds a villain that's really memorable and uh it, it's it's just kind of a, a a lush and beautiful movie to look at in addition to really liking the movie the first time i ever watched it we like you said we've interacted with a lot of the people involved in the making of that movie and so it's really found a special place in my heart that I wasn't expecting. Yeah. Um, it, it's one that I will definitely pop on from time to time. I think it's really beautiful to look at a lot of really fun shadow play. And again, Ted Nicolau just being at the helm uh, of something, taking it in a direction that was going to make it a more focused story. I mean, we didn't do an episode on subspecies three uh, yet, but it is a continuation of the story and whether or not it is as successful as two as a standalone will be discussed then. But I didn't really expect this sequel to this series to become something so near and dear to me, but it really has. And so even outside of the world of full moon and the world of empire, it's become a movie that I genuinely just really love. And I have so, so much respect and love for the people involved in the making of it. And I will always you know, bring it up in conversation of a super underrated, uh, underseen, underserviced movie that is about as good as a B movie can be. And with that, we find ourselves at our our shared number one. And probably almost not almost really an, a surprise. Yeah, kind of anticlimactic in a lot of ways. Because what else was it going to be for both of us? But uh, Stuart Gordon's From Beyond, a movie that is a visual feast it is deeply weird it's kinky it's sexy it's funny it feels dangerous in a way that horror movies don't really feel anymore it feels tactile and gross and sensual and uh it's just deeply strange and deeply memorable um really in my mind it can only be beaten by one other movie that we haven't talked about yet but it it, spoiler alert it is another Stuart gordon lovecraft (laughs) adaptation that i think is gonna be kind of untouchable when we get to it I, I would agree with that. I, we won't say the name of that movie, but I feel like can, context clues are enough that people can figure it out for themselves. Absolutely. But uh, yeah. we will we will hit that movie eventually. I think one of the keys to the, to making the show successful is to spread these things out a little bit. Mm-hmm. You don't want to run through all of the heavy hitters right away. We have uh, to make you eat your vegetables it. once in a while. Yeah. Exactly. The, the, the so, vegetables of torchlight films, I guess. <laughs> those are that's that's more nutrition well, than anyone has ever subscribed to those movies. Right. And it's like so torchlight, we've had a couple um Moonbeam really only one to this point. So I'm really curious mm-hmm. to see as the show progresses and more Moonbeam movies and franchises are introduced and sequels to Prehysteria and other stuff, where they're gonna slot in. And this is gonna be a harder list to curate as it was than it was to this point. But I look forward to the challenge, and this was really fun, Steve, kind of looking at where you've ranked these 50 movies. Listeners, I hope that you enjoyed hearing you know, how we ranked them. And again, if a movie you really loved ranked number 38 or 40 out of 50 for us, it doesn't mean that we, we didn't enjoy it. It doesn't mean that we oh, don't Oh, no, think take, take it personally. Take it personally, listeners. <laughs> it is a specific slight on you. You know who I'm talking no, about. Please, please don't. But anyway, thank you so much, listeners. We wanted to come with you a little bonus episode here and give you our rankings for these 50 movies. Obviously, if you're listening to this, then you know where to find us. But just uh, keep tuning in every week and keep making the show possible. And uh, looking forward to see when we kind of check in again, maybe after 75 or 100 of these things, and see <laughs> what's changed and uh, what's usurped things in other rankings. But For now, those are our 50, and we hope that you guys have enjoyed listening to this. Bye.